All right. Hey, if you're just joining us, we are, um, we've been worshiping the Lord and, and just enjoying this Lord's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you ladies who've just now joined us, and maybe we didn't get a chance to tell you that. Um, you know, may, may, man, may the Lord bless you today, and uh, we're excited about it. We're going to move into a time of, of teaching now. Before we do, in case you kind of missed the front end of things, um, Lord willing, <clears throat> this coming Sunday, we're going to gather as the body of Christ. And, um, and I realize there's a lot of angst about that from a, a lot of people and, and totally get all of that. Um, but, but we're, we're going to meet. We're going to social distance. When you get there Sunday, uh, chairs will be spread out and, and all of that. And uh, you'll need to provide some hand gel. We'll try if we can find some somewhere. We'll have some ready for you as well. And, uh, and we're just going to gather, though. There's something powerful about that and and i want to take a minute and just remind us of that because i hear a lot of people say well we, we you know the church isn't a building and no doubt i think if anybody's heard me speak you, you know that we know it's not about a building and so when i say gather in a building i don't I, it's not about gathering in a building uh and and you know you well we gather virtually and we can worship and, and and listen to messages that's a piece of the body of christ to worship and to hear truth but there is a piece of the body of Christ that as we gather, and don't miss this, when we gather, and I had somebody want to say, well, you can gather online. Can I just tell you it's not the same? It's not the same to gather online virtually as it is to be together in one place, to look each other in the eye, and to be able to use the Holy Spirit-given gifts that we have to encourage each other. Ephesians says that when we gather together, that we house the fullness of the living God. There's power in the church. There's power when we gather together that's not the same when we're separated out. And so we're committed to gathering as the body of Christ to, to allow you to exercise the gifts, the manifestation of the Spirit of God that was given to you when you put your faith and trust in Him and you repented of Him, you a gift was deposited in you. And we're missing that as we don't gather like this. We get it in pockets. But the church was never meant to do this. You know, the church gathers underground in a lot of places. They gather, though. Though it takes them all day to gather in that little place, they gather. And it's not about the place. It's anywhere. We could gather in the woods if we choose to. We could have pop-up church or whatever it is that we need to do. But we want to gather because we need to experience the fullness of God. And more importantly, this world that needs what the church offers. Uh, I know they didn't mean to act like we weren't essential, but that's kind of what it feels like, that they deemed us non-essential. No one ever said that, but it felt that way to me at least anyway. And I think we are of all the most essential thing that there is uh, in this world. That we, we are the grace of God to this world. We have three things that the world lost in the fall. We have the light of the truth of God that's us, that we are to be the light to the world. And we have the love of God that we shed abroad in our hearts, and we are to bring the love of God to the world. And we have life. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. God made us alive. We are the life. We, in us is life, and that abundantly. And we should bring that life, light, and love to this world. And so we do go, but we gather to experience the fullness of of the living God among us. And so we're going to do that. And um, we, I need to know how many of you are planning on coming. Uh, so I'm asking you to do a couple of things. If, hey, if you're, if you're just kind of visiting here and dropping in and out like a lot of us, I've been dropping in and out of churches watching virtually. It's been an amazing uh, thing to just see my brothers in Christ begin to preach and, and uh, to hear what's going on that I can't visit in other churches. But maybe you, you haven't been going to church anywhere and you think, man, I'd kind of like to try that church. You can direct message me on my personal Facebook page. Uh, those of us who are the body of Christ and, 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 and we call Restoration Our Home already, then you're a part of our closed restoration group. It's a closed group. You have to have actually become kind of a regular among us to get in that. It's not for anybody because in there we share personal things. You can tell me in there that, that you're gathering. And the only reason I need to know is so that 
uh, if we need to have a couple of services to accommodate the people that want to show up, then, then we're going to do that. So we may have an 8.30, and we may have a 10.30. Um, and, and so I just want to know that. So if you wouldn't mind, would you just kind of let us know if you, if you plan to go and you're, you're going to do that? And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you there. So listen, uh, we're going to open up the Word, and we're going to see another place in which we find the shelter of God today. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is what we do every time we gather together. I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm just going to ask you to let the Lord speak to you today, to, to in, invite the Holy Spirit who resides in those of us who are believers to have His way. If you're not a believer, ask Him anyway. His ears attentive to those who hunger for Him. And so let's just ask God to speak to us today. I'm going to do that. And then we're going to open up the Word and enjoy our time together. Father, speak to us today. We need our hearts encouraged and we need boldness in our life. We need to be the church. We need to, we need to know everything that you want for us. We, we gather here today to hear your word go forth, to open up the living word, the truth above all truth that lets us know what is when everyone's telling us something else. And so, Father, would you speak to us today? Would you grow us today? Would you mature us today? Would you strengthen us today? And I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been looking at these uh, sheltering with God, and it's been kind of an incredible journey for me, just to journey through and see some of the things that where we find our shelter in God. We started with Psalm 91, that great psalm that speaks about uh, making our, our abode with Him that to dwell with Him. And I can think of no greater time that we should be dwelling with the King of Kings than at a time when our world seems in, in kind of turmoil and, and chaos and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of concerns and fear uh, and anger is, is, is brewing um, among us. And we looked at the fact of, the, uh, of sheltering with, with His grace and, and what that means to be carried along by by God in times of trouble and distress, and that that's what He wants. He wants us to feel at times weak, uh, because when we are made weak, then He is made strong. And no doubt, He's got His hand on what's taking place right now. And so, so we we recognize that, and 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 we understand that. We we also saw that uh, we can shelter in the under the blood, just like the children of Israel did. So that when we that was an Easter message, a Resurrection Day message about the blood. We we talked about sheltering with His sovereignty. Uh, we talked about sheltering uh, in hope when it feels like when our soul doesn't feel that way, that we feel a little discouraged. You know, oh soul, why are you weary and why are you downcast? Is what the psalmist asked for in Psalm forty two and forty three. And he said, Well, I will yet put my hope in, in you. And so we we've looked at at so many of these things. We looked at at, at sheltering with the Word of God and the power of it. Uh, we saw that last week. And so today, uh, I, I want to continue that, that series. Listen, we're, we're living in strange times. And, and it's odd. And, and, and I'm seeing um, among the people that, that, that I'm aware of and that I know, uh, all of us come at this thing from a, from a different angle. You've got, uh, you've got small business owners that uh, that really feel the need to to work again to to provide. There, some of them are losing their family's business. Now, I realize we can all have our thoughts about that, but just just let's let's learn to be empathetic about all the groups that are struggling right now and have kind of an honest conversation here. Some of them have been handed a business that their grandfathers may have started, and now they own it, and they're they're feeling it slip away. Understand the panic, not just of of money but of respect and honor and, and all of those things and, and, and the, the fear of, of losing that. Can, can we appreciate that there are people out there that are like, man, I, what, this is wrong. I got to get to work. And, and um, you know, some, some are, are losing their livelihood. They are. We're seeing businesses close, right? And we can act like this shouldn't be about money, but, but we, to live, we, we have to feed our families. And, and some that I've chatted with say, man, I, I'm concerned because I, I can maybe make this, but I got employees that if I shut down, 
they they can't and and so uh there's a, there's fear and there's there's anxiety that comes in that group there, there's the other group that's physically vulnerable to this right that that have some sort of immune deficiency uh my my own uh son and and, and daughter-in-law and my girls in in, in Atlanta, that they are that. I have a granddaughter, severely special needs. She's immune compromised in the area that this disease tends to to assault. And so, uh, man, they you know they're careful about who comes and goes and and all of those things. And and we've seen this kind of prey upon the elderly. And <laughs> I know they keep wanting to say 60s old, and I'm I'm in that threshold right there. Uh, I don't feel it, but but I guess truth be told. Uh, as our bodies age, there's the vulnerability that, that, that we find in that. And, and so, so those are concerned and, and, and they're fearful of what's going on. And, and the care providers who are meeting those needs and, and those of us who are maybe, maybe wanting to care for our aged parents and, and not wanting to get with them and all of that and fearful of all of those things, can we appreciate the fact that there are people out there right now that are anxious about that? And so when we have these conversations about let's just pretend that it's not happening. Those people can, in a sense, get a little more concerned because they're fearful that that uh, that if you don't take care of yourself, then, then you might infect them. That's a reality in their world. It may not be true, and it may or may not be. I'm not arguing that. I'm simply saying it's real to them. And so we have to honor that. And, and, and I think we would be remiss if we didn't understand how our, our, uh, our friends of, of color, so to speak, uh, the blacks and the, the Latinos and, and what's going on in their world and, and at least understand that for them it's it's a crazier time than we could even comprehend. I mean, uh, you know, with just that shooting that, that took place in, in Georgia and the unconscionable act of, of that of that deal that's an all too familiar scene for too many to see that just innocent black people are being caught up and, and these atrocities are being put down and and you can have whatever fight you want to fight and I'm going to tell you it's wrong there's no reason why someone should be picked out because of that and and I don't want to jump into that I just think it's under, that we need to understand that and so they feel f unfairly targeted by some of these things as though there's no justice uh, and there are some studies that are showing that that this virus is kind of um, affecting them more than anybody else and so they feel when we don't see that, that is, is this a government plot to, to distinguish them? And though you and me may, may want to say, well, that's just that's, those, that's crazy talk. It, it's not. It took them 100 years of the founding of this country. And I'm just speaking about our country, not the world. But it took 100 years before they were recognized and, and a war had to be fought so that they could stand as free men and women. It was another hundred years before they were able to go and, and sit at a counter as freely as, as white people and, it, and to have the right to vote. And so you, we should appreciate the fact of, of where they're coming from and, and why maybe they don't, they're not as trusting as some of us about other things. And they have a right to be. In the 30s, in our own state, Tuskegee Airmen were given syphilis without their knowledge. Just to, and that went on from 1932 to maybe 72. It went on a lot of years, and and so there's some things like that, and and I, I think we have to be sensitive to that, right? And then there are the freedom lovers, right? Those are the ones who who think our 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 uh, we have certain right, which which you know, I mean, I think we all agree with that, and we see them being assaulted, and we we get angry, and we want to find an enemy to fight to get our our freedoms and our rights back, and. They may or may not come in this lifetime. We have been blessed to have those rights, but but uh, the the Christians in the early church they had no rights like that. Down through the ages, those have because we had a blip in time where we had those, and I deeply appreciate that. They may flee from us, and that ought to create a little angst and fear in us in that sense if we're not careful. And then then there are those who who what I call they they understand the times, and and by that I mean that they recognize that this thing that's here quite possibly is moving us. We know we're moving closer to the last days. We know we're moving closer to the day of the Lord 
The day of the Lord is when he will come back and he will set his foot on this earth again and he will bring justice at that point. And he will, we, he will preserve our lives, those of us who have, have followed him. And, and there's a reality of that. And those who discern the times know that the spirit of Antichrist is among us. That we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. And we can pick, pick and choose uh, party and persuasion and whatever you want to do. But listen. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's the it's the spirit of the Antichrist is there, and and in some of that, there's a though though for some it's like, come on, Lord, let's let's go. I'm ready, and there are others uh, that I'm concerned about my children and my grandchildren and 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 the persecution and the the uh, the hostility that, that they're going to face. Is that, is that right? Am I and I may be missing a group. But I, I believe that, that that's what's going on. And I think all of us, for different reasons, are feeling some anger and we're feeling some frustration and we're feeling some fear. Even those of us who would say, but we fully trust the Lord. There's a matter of being a little anxious about things. And today, I, I don't want to talk about all that. I just want us to get perspective. That there's a lot of, of people coming at this from different things. I think it would be helpful, especially for our local body, to recognize that and to love each other deeply and to understand what it means to maintain the unity of the Spirit. We can all have different dis agreements and disagreements about who's doing what to who. But let's do this. Let's continue to maintain this unity that God's given to us by His grace. Okay? Now, Having said that, what's this shelter we're going to talk about today? It's a powerful shelter, and it's called the shelter of prayer. And uh, I just think we have to look at this again. I think we live in a day and age when a lot of us maybe feel like, well, I don't know, prayer's going to work here. We forget about it. We panic and we argue and we fight as opposed to going, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go into my closet. You know, there was a movie not too long ago that spoke of the war room, right? You remember that? That lady that had that closet and that was her war room and no matter what was going on around her and what her kids were doing or what everybody else was doing, she knew they didn't have the last say. She knew that God did and so she made that closet a war room. I'm telling you, a lot of you should close your internet down and go find that war room and spend some time there. But I want you to understand some things as we move into this subject today. There is in heaven, God most high, who sits on his throne and he rules in justice and in power. And you may not sense it yet, but it's coming. Now, justice may feel like sometimes it's delayed, but in the kingdom, it's not forgotten. And so even though the martyrs are in heaven right now saying, Lord, how long before you avenge what's gone on with us? And though Peter writes to a group of believers scattered abroad and says, I know there are people saying that, that he's not coming back. But I would tell you, he says they're wrong. For a, he is coming back, but but one day is as a thousand to the Lord, and a thousand is his one day. And we don't know his timetable, but I know this: there is a throne room in heaven. The Creator of the universe, God Most High, is sitting on, and His doors are open to those of us who are His. And the writer of the Hebrews says that I can come boldly into that throne room and stop whatever fanfare is going on in the business of the Creator at that moment. He, his eyes fall on me and He wants to know my need. This is who He is. And when I come boldly to Him, I go, God, I don't like what's going on. He hears me. When I say, God, I'm scared. He hears me. When I say, God, this is wrong and I want to do something, He reigns me in or He lets me go and gives me orders. But in that room, in that war room, in that room in heaven, there's incredible power. And there's nothing blocking us from that. The veil that was torn in two at the cross permanently opened to that door for you and me who are His children. Just like my children have always access to me as an earthly father. How much more will my heavenly Father give me His access? Because that's who He is. And so I just want us to understand that. And so when the body of believers gathered together in, in, in Acts, 
And there was great persecution. Acts chapter 4, it says they gathered together because their, 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 their friends and apostles and leaders had been persecuted and they gathered. It said that they were in one accord, that they were in unity about this thing. And they began to fall underneath the shelter of God and they began to petition to Him. And they cried out for Him for boldness. And do you know what happened in that place? It says literally that the place in which they were praying was shaken. You know why? Because the Spirit of the living God, as He invades the people who gather together, so while we gather together, as the fullness of God hit that room, it shook it like no one had ever experienced. And it said, and they were filled with the Spirit and went out speaking boldly the name of Christ. Isn't that an amazing story? And it's true. You get to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and it says, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Who has a God so near to them, the Lord our God, whenever we call on Him, hears us. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call to me and I will answer you. Maybe we've forgotten just to call on him. Maybe we've gotten so used to our little mealtime prayers and our little morning prayers and our little bedtime prayers that we've forgotten that he delights that we call on him daily, that we, that we uh, constantly are praying to him, but he delights in that. Psalm 4, 3 says this, the Lord hears when we call to him. Psalm 50, 15 says this, Call upon the Lord in the day of trouble. I don't know about you, but it looks like the day of trouble to me. And what does he say? I will rescue you. Isn't this powerful? So we come to a passage. I do have a passage today for us to hang some truth on because we're just talking in, in real terms about this today. So here's the passage. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Now listen to that. Be anxious for nothing. Stop the activity of being anxious. Are you anxious today about, about all those categories maybe that we mentioned? Are you anxious about your rights being gone? Are you anxious about being vulnerable? Are you, are you anxious about your kids and what's going what's gonna to be left of them? Are you, are you anxious because, because you feel like your race and your, your people are being extinguished in, in, in difficulties and nobody's listening and there's no justice? And, and do, we, do, you, do you feel those things? And he says right now to you and me, Stop being anxious. Because He has a cure for it. Don't be anxious about anything. But with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now we're going to break this down real quickly in just a second. But before we do, I just want us to hear a few truths from the Word of God. That, that talks about some of these things. And, and I think about um, Psalm, uh, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Isn't that powerful? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Matthew 6, in that great sermon on the mount, the outrageous sermon of God begins to speak in terms of the fact that uh, he says he says the same thing that Paul says. Stop being anxious. And he begins to give us an illustration of the lilies of the field and how dressed and clothed they are. And he begins to talk of birds of the field that, that their needs are met for food and they don't even have to ask. And he says this, he says, does your heavenly Father not love you more than these? And, and by, by worrying, can you gain any, a measure of life by that? What does he tell us there? Stop that. The psalmist in Psalm 46, love this, I almost preached this passage this morning. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth should change and though the mountains go into the sea, though its waters foam and though the mountains quake, its swelling pride, we will not fear. Isn't that good? I mean, this is truth from the Word of God. And I just think we should sometimes take, just, let's just listen to this. So, so let's kind of break this, this thing down, this passage that we're looking at. And he says this, be anxious for nothing. Now, what's the first point of this thing? God does not want us to be stressed. God's not interested in you and me being stressed out. He wants us to keep our eyes on Jesus, right? Just to focus on Him. And when I begin to focus on Him, all the things of this world becomes strangely dim, right? Didn't we hear that song today? That, that the things begin to pale. 
Right now, it's easy. It's like it's like Peter when he got out of the boat and God. He asked Lord. He said, "Lord, tell me to come to you, and I will." What did he know there? He knew if God said to do it, he could do it. So there's a man of faith. We're not talking about a man that didn't have great faith. And as he as he steps out of that boat and he begins to walk toward Christ, and his eyes were on him, the man was walking on water. And then what happened? The storm started doing its thing, and and he began to get a little distracted and he began to look at everything around him and he took his eyes off of Jesus. And when we take our eyes off the author and finisher of our faith, we're going to stumble. And so he began to sink in that water and it's at that moment Christ pulls him up out of, out of that water. But you see, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. So I can't worry about, about this time that we're living in right now. I wish that that uh, the day of the Lord would come quickly, and my children and grandchildren could let's all go to heaven right now. But that may not happen, and so I have to be prepared for that. But I can't worry about that. I have to trust that God, who's caring for me, is the same God who will care for them. And though I may see uh, justice denied to to my people and and everything else and all of that's going on, and though I want to fix that, and I start looking at that, and I can get angry with that, I have to come back to the fact that there is a judge. And he does mete out his justice. And there will be justice for, for those who, who, who don't find it in this life. There will be justice. And I have to know that. And so I can't be anxious. I can't, I can't afford to do that. I've got to keep my eyes on Jesus. I've got to know that. I've got to know that that's what he says in his truth and in his word. And so God doesn't want me to be stressed. The second thing we saw in that passage, be anxious for nothing but in everything, through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So the second thing is that God wants you and me to bring every need to Him. Every need He wants me to bring it all, He says. Come on, bring it. You got a need? Bring it. Now, there are times, honestly, when my kids would do that, I go, come on, can't you figure that out by yourself? God never does that. I bring my need to Him, and He's like, all right. We had that conversation, son, yesterday. And here's what I told you. You didn't listen. I'm going to tell you again, do this, right? God ever talk to you that way and, and teach you? But but every need I have, if I am if I have a need, Lord, you got to fix this. Lord, what are you going to do about this? Lord, what are you going to do about that? It's, he, it's him that I look to. I can't worry about my finances. I need to be a good steward of it. But I got to know that at the end of the day, it could be gone like that, couldn't it? And when it does, God, I, I need some resources because I got to buy food. This, this he... Everything. He's want you to bring everything. And it's a continuous action. It's an imperative in, in the Scriptures. What that means is you constantly are bringing your needs before Him. This is what it means to be dependent on the King of Kings. And so, so prayer is a general term. It just means those things we pray. Uh, God, God, keep me safe today. Uh, God, uh, let this be going on. Lord, Lord, protect me here. Lord, give me wisdom for this. There's certain things that we're praying constantly as we go through the day. Uh, we see somebody with a need, and we go, Lord, can you meet that need? We, somebody put something up on, on the Internet or wherever, and we go, oh, Lord, would you, I pray for that. Would you meet that need? Would you do that? That's prayer, general prayer. We just do that. But he says not only that, but supplication. That's where you and me join in together, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting a specific prayer to God. And I'm, it's a specific act that I'm asking. Jesus reminds me in, act, in, in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you. Knock, and you shall uh, the, seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened unto you. The first part of me is to seek the Lord. Uh, James chapter four tells me, or yeah, chapter four tells me that you have not because you ask not. Listen, there are things that God wants to give, wants to meet our needs. He's waiting on us to ask Him. Always, I say this when I teach this passage. I think. That there must be some storeroom with my name on it in heaven. It's all the stuff that I could have if I just simply asked. My goal is to get to heaven and not have God open that up and it be full. I'm, I'm kind of thinking, I'd like mine to be empty. I'd like to know that I ask everything that I needed, I asked, and I emptied that storehouse before I ever made my way to heaven. He says, now if you don't get these prayers answered, it's because you're asking with the wrong motive or you're asking because you're you're jealous or whatever whatever else is going on. But the truth is that He wants us to pray to Him. And He wants us to do it from a grateful heart, with thanksgiving. 
Let your request be made known to God. God, I thank you that you hear my voice. God, I thank you that you've been faithful to me up until this point. God, I thank you that you've given me a brain and wisdom and resources. I thank you that you bring people into my life that meet my need. I thank you for the Holy Spirit who gives me wisdom. I thank you for the Word that gives me knowledge. I, I thank you, Father, for those things. And here's what I need. See, this is a great shelter to come to. It's our war room. It's our hope. It is prayer that can change the world literally. And the third thing, as we kind of get to a close on this, that God promises supernatural peace. This is what He promises us. What does He say? In the peace of God. Peace. Isn't that an amazing word? Not not peace with God. We have that. Not the kind of peace that the world thinks where we're just kind of slowed down long enough to uh, reload before we start shooting each other again. But a peace that defies whatever's going on around me. It's a peace, the Bible says, that guards my, my heart and my mind and it's beyond comprehension. And the peace of God surpasses comprehension. It, we're not just talking about a little piece. We're talking about a piece that goes, I can't, even, I can't even fathom what's going on here. Listen, I've had experiences in my own life where I've been in the middle of something and I should be caving in. I should be looking just to ask God to take me home. And it went on for a season. I don't mean a day or two. I mean a season in the middle of that. I knew some people were praying for me and I was praying for me. And there was this peace that let me sleep like you see, this is this is this is what he's he tells me happens. I always think of the story of Daniel. You remember Daniel? Uh, they, they they knew him to be a man of, of God and a man of faith, and they wanted to, they wanted to get rid of him. And so they got the king to agree to set an order that anybody who prays to anything else but king uh, would be would be thrown to the lions and would be killed. And and so Daniel knew that 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 edict went out. And actually, the king was a friend of his. And, that edict went out, and Daniel, knowing that, opened his shutters, bowed his head to the east toward Jerusalem, and began, and began to pray. And people were watching, and they knew it, and they got it. Now, the story goes that they took Daniel, and they, they threw him into the lion's den, and Daniel spent the night asleep with the lions, with their mouths shut by the king of kings and by the God of all creation. While the king, his sleep fled him and he was worried and he was anxious about Daniel. And as soon as daylight came, he ran to the area in which Daniel was and said, Oh, Daniel, do you live? And he said, Oh, king, I, I am alive. Who had anxiety there? It was the king. Daniel was the one who should have had the anxiety. But he walked with the living God. And that peace that surpasses all comprehension guarded him in the midst of that den with those lions there. Isn't that powerful? Let me ask you a few questions. Is he a good father? That's the question. Is God a good father? You have to answer that in your heart. You can even post it right now if you want to. It doesn't matter to me, but I'm asking you the question. Is he a good father? Does he want us to come to him? And petition him for our needs? Does he listen to us? Is he distracted by other things around the world or is his ear attentive to my cry? I'm asking. What do you believe? I know, I know what the word says, and I know that he does. I know that his ear is attentive to my cry. I know he's the God who sees me. So just as we look at our kids and know what's going on about them and, and when they're struggling, what their tone of life is, so does the Father of all creation. I'm asking, do you believe that? Is he able? God is able. Is he able? Is he? Is he? I mean, I'm just asking, is there anything outside of his control? Is he able to change the hearts of people? Can he do that? Without you and me having to, having to, to argue with him to do that? Is it possible that in a moment he could change a heart? I believe he can because I've seen it. And I know it. And I've got friends who were opposed to him who now walk with him. Is he able to change circumstances? Is he able to change circumstances? Is he able to take you out of one situation that looks like you're going to drown and put you in one that you couldn't even imagine? Is he able to do that? Has he done that for you already? Is he able to change your circumstances? I'm telling you, 
I've seen my life go from having zero to having all my needs met. Practically and realistically. In a way that I thought never could. I've seen him do that. I've seen him take a situation where we were looking for a specific house on a specific road within these parameters and nothing was available. And then God, without it having a for sale sign in the yard, I walked up and talked to that man and we worked a deal out. And it was at the very between the very lines that we had asked God to do that. I have seen that. I have cried out that God would meet the needs when we didn't have any money to, to take our kids and get them back to school clothes. And I watched and someone took our uh, took that need that I didn't even speak about and give me money for that need. We have seen that time and time again. He's able to change circumstances, isn't he? Can he still part the waters? Can he? Can he do that? He did it several times throughout the scriptures. You feel like you're kind of at that between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, and you think, man, there's no way out. I am surrounded. I'm surrounded. Love that song. I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded by you. When I think the whole world, I'm surrounded by him. The Lord encamps around those who fear him. But will he give us a way out? Can he make a way where there is no way? Can he do that to you today? Can he do that with this virus? Can he do this any way he wants to? Is he able? And is he desiring that we simply ask him to do that which he is able to do? Is he able to calm a storm? Miss Bruin, can he do that? Does he still calm storms today? Can he still... With one voice, say, peace be still. Can he do that? Can he cause the sun to stand still, do you think? He did that in Joshua's life. Can he, can he do something cosmically crazy like that if he wanted to? Could he do that? We think, well, I don't know. How do we not know? We, he's done it before. Is he able? That's all I'm asking, is he able? Do you believe he's able? See, if, you, if we believe he's able... Doesn't anxiety kind of flee from that? If we remember two things, that He's sovereign and that He's good. Is He still with us in the fire? The time when He decides, I'm not going to spare you, but I'm going to let you be thrown into the fire, but nothing's going to be burned but the ropes that bind you. Remember the three children, Hebrew children, and the story in the Scriptures? Is He still with us in the fire? I could tell you story after story of martyrs that that I've read and, and what they say about, about seeing Him and the sweetness of what it was to be burned at the stake, to be put, put on a rack that I mentioned earlier and stretched and, and, and to be tortured and all of those things. And there was this sweet peace because He was with them in the midst of that. Do we believe He can shut the mouths of the lions? Do we? Do we believe that the enemy that surrounded us and would love to see our demise and our death, do we believe that He has the power to say not today? Does He? If we believe that, isn't there kind of an anxiety that, that, that falls off of us? Isn't that, you know what I'm saying? It's, this is good, isn't it? I mean, this is I love looking at the Scriptures like this with you. I wish I could see your faces. It's a lot more fun. I'm looking at little, my little camera eyeball thing, and, and uh, I, 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 it's, a, it's a difficult thing, but, but man, this truth is rich and good, isn't it? I just want you to know, but you know God is able, okay? So if you're stressed out about this and you're worried about, about your, your, the frailty of your body or your loved ones or whatever, and I'm not saying that we don't, we're not wise, uh, but, but let's be trusting in, in, in God. It's, it's not our wisdom and it's not our care. It, it, it's God most high. So if we're fearful for this, about this disease, can, can we just cry out to Him? Can we just open up that uh, or go into the, the throne room of God and, Crawl up in his lap and call him Abba Father and say, I'm scared. It's okay to do that. That calmness and peace comes over us when we're in his arms, right? Right? I, I mean, come on. Those of us who are fearful about, you know, whatever else is going on, our the world falling apart and the, and the Antichrist coming and the mark of the beast and all those things, can, can, can we understand that we already knew it was coming? Maybe this is the time. It could be a thousand years from now. We don't really know, do we? We know the spirit of the Antichrist is among us. Is that cause for us to shrink in fear? Or to cry out like they did in Acts chapter 4, asking for boldness, protection. Is he able to do that? Can he do that? Can he do that in your life? I don't know what's going on. It may have nothing to do with this virus and the season that we're in. It could be, a, it could be something completely unrelated. 
here's what I want you to know. Go into that closet. Cry out to the Lord who sees in secret and who hears you and He will reward you for that. All right? And we're, you know what we come out of there with? If we don't come out with anything else, we come out with peace and perspective. I'm telling you, those two things are amazing. And sometimes when I get those two things, it's like, well, I don't really care about the other anymore. Okay? I've kept you too long. I do have a couple of songs I want you to listen to. And, and I want us to, uh, to just let these sink in. Listen. Take some time right now. I'm going to play a song, Come to the Altar. Um, I want you to, it's about coming in repentance to Him. And if you need that, you should do that. You should cry out. If you're not a believer today, you should cry out to that. But sometimes coming to the altar is not just about crying out for needs of repentance and confession, but it's to plead God to do something. So while this song plays, why don't you gather whoever's with you and maybe you do that. All right, listen.